Hello, and thanks for joining us for the fifth of our webinar series celebrating the 50th anniversary of the National Center for Higher Education Management Systems, or NCHEMS. These webinars are hosted by NCHEMS staff members who have specific expertise in higher education issues and practices, and today it's my turn. Joining me are three individuals who all have done and continue to do extraordinary work in post-secondary education that is enabled by technology. My first guest is Candace Till, who's an associate professor at Stanford University, but on loan to Amazon for a couple of years. Dale Johnson is the director of adaptive learning initiatives at Arizona State University, and Heather Hiles is the president and CEO of the California Online Community College District and Calbright College. I'm Sally Johnstone, president of NCHEMS, and we're going to be listening to the panelists for the first part of this webinar. Then we will ask them to respond to your questions. I'm also joined today by two of my colleagues here at NCHEMS, Sarah Torres Lugo, who will monitor the questions you want to ask the panelists, and Liz Weeks, who will be managing the webinar. A little on logistics. To pose a question or a comment, please click on the Q&A in your controls. Now, if you're in the full screen mode, you might need to hover your mouse over the screen to make the controls visible. Once you click on Q&A, a window will appear. Type in your question in the text field and click send to submit it. If you want to pose a question to a specific panelist, please make sure to begin your question with the name of that panelist. The chat function is not going to be monitored, so please use the Q&A feature. Let's get started with Candace Till. Some of you may remember Candace for her pioneering work at Carnegie Mellon University, where she and her team really developed adaptive learning technologies that guided learners through course materials. The learners were queried as they progressed through the materials, and the materials themselves, which they encountered, shifted according to the needs of the individual learner. In my grad school days, which was a long time ago, we had paper versions of this process. And while it was useful in acquiring knowledge and understanding, it was so hard to use that it absolutely faded away until technology caught up. So let me turn this over to Candace. Great, thank you, Sally. So I'll be talking about how is technology enabling greater learner success. Next. So whenever we're starting to talk about technology and learning, I always like to start at the same place, which is starting with the learner. And in this case, I need to qualify, I mean the human learner, not the machine learner. And one of the questions we need to ask is, how is technology? What is the power of technology for enabling student success? And when I'm in large groups and I ask that question, I usually get one of three answers. Next. Um, the, oh. Sorry, the diversity of the learner uh, is one of the things we need to consider. And I don't just mean the demographic diversity of the learner. I also mean the diversity of the learner with respect to their background knowledge, their relevant skills, the goals, and the attributions, um, how they make sense of their learning experiences that they bring to the learning environment. Now I'll talk about the technology. So when I talk about the technology, I usually get one of three answers. What's the power of the technology? And people will talk about these three big powers. One of them is access and convenience. With a computer or a mobile device, you can access learning anytime, anywhere. The second power is all the cool stuff you can do with technology that's hard to do, as Sally mentioned, with paper-based processes, like the simulation capability. And now augmented reality, virtual reality, there's lots of cool stuff happening in the technology to support learning. And the third real power that people speak about is connection. That this unit, this cell phone or this computer, is not just you interacting with that individual piece of technology, 
but that that piece of technology is on a network. So we can connect our learners to other learners, to experts, to information, to the world. So when I talk about the power of technology, most people are thinking about these three and they are all important. But actually, I would pose that the biggest power of this technology to be able to transform teaching and learning is the way that technology is used by, say, Amazon or Google or Netflix. The power of this technology is not just pushing the learner's experience out to them, but pushing it to an interface. Because in that interface, we can observe the learner by collecting the data from the learner's interaction and using that data to drive very powerful feedback loops to the different actors in the system. Next. Those actors are the learner themselves, so we can give the learner information and support to help them make good decisions about their own learning to teachers or mentors or instructors so they can have real insight into where their learners are and how best to support their learners. We can give feedback to the learning experience designers, to people who create the learning assets, so they get insight into where their assets are working, where they're not, so they can continuously improve them. And then also back to learning researchers, because what undergirds all of this is a science of learning. And the learner's interactions and the data that's generated can help us not only use that science, but also continuously build and refine the science. So let's talk a minute about the science. What are the sciences that we're talking about as learning sciences? Well, the obvious ones, which you probably heard a lot about, is neuroscience, cognitive science, and then I just spoke a little bit about the machine learning and data science. So I want to take a minute to just bounce back in to talk a little bit more deeply about the social psychological science and the impact that has on learning, because that is oftentimes a less discussed uh, area. And I'll draw on the work from my colleagues at Stanford in three major areas. Uh, Claude Steele's work on stereotype threat or identity threat, uh, Jeff Cohen or Greg Walton's work on social belonging, and then Carol Dweck's work on academic mindset. And all of these are about how the attributions that learners make about the learning experience and about their identity and, and those attributions and gendering those, those good attributions can bolster motivation, engagement, as well as persistence in the face of difficulty, which are all important for learning. In Carol Dweck's work, uh, she talks about two different kinds of mindsets that people can have. A fixed mindset, where you believe that intelligence is innate um, rather than learnable. And that you hear people say, some people are smart, other people just aren't smart. Or some people are math people, other people just aren't math people. Um, versus a growth mindset, where um, people believe that they have the causal power to improve their minds which uh, tends to lead to much better learning behavior. We did a small experiment in my um, open statistics course with a community college where we um, did a mindset intervention and were able to dramatically improve students' both persistence and learning gain when it got to the very difficult parts of the statistics course. I'm happy to talk more about that if people want to. Um, so uh, that's how the sciences, which, which leads to this virtuous cycle. Next. And the virtuous cycle is we use what we know from the sciences to design better learning experiences. Those better learning experiences facilitate better learning activity and interactions and engagement with the learners, which then allow us to generate better learning data, and also better models to understand human learning, which then allow us to generate better insights, which then using those insights, we can use to design better learning, and learning experiences. And that sets up a continuous virtuous cycle for continuous improvement in efficient and effective knowledge and capability development. So I'll just end with two quotes, one from uh, Herb Simon, who said improvement in post-secondary education will require converting teaching and course uh, from a solo sport to a community-based research activity. I modified 
Herb Simon's quote in 2015 to say improvement in post-secondary education will require converting teaching and courseware and platform and analytic system development from a solo sport to a community-based research activity. And this, the final quote will be from uh, William Balmall, who said back in 1967, without a complete revolution in our approach to teaching, we cannot go beyond our current levels of productivity. My message is, it used to be, such a revolution is possible. But now, as you'll hear with our next speakers, such a revolution is happening. But my question is the same. Given the power of the technology to support this revolution, who will lead it? Oh, Candace, that's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let's shift for a moment and talk about or hear about how one of these technological frameworks has enabled practices like, well, specifically adaptive learning. Dale Johnson's work at Arizona State University as they adopted this innovation has taught many lessons that he's going to share with us. So Dale, over to you. Thank you. I'll pick up where Candace left off and talk about how we're doing this. The question we posed is, is that a classroom in your cell phone? And the answer is yes. The future's already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So what we found is there are opportunities to take advantage of this idea of providing personalized instruction through a cell phone. We just have to start to change our instructional processes to get there. Next slide. So what do you need to build that future? Well, you're going to need faculty, instructional designers, technologists, vendors, graphic designers, video producers, librarians, and leaders. This is really a team sport. Just like the quotes that Candace was using at the end of her talk, we've experienced this as a process that requires a new mode of interaction between all of these, these different uh, roles. Uh, obviously, faculty retain control of the process, but when you think about the specialization and the technical requirements to deliver instruction through a cell phone, you can't do it alone. And what we found is that even in the leadership level, it's not just the faculty leadership, but also support from the department chair, the dean, and the provost in order to make this kind of transformation possible. Next. So how do you go about building it? I'll give an example of a math course where in the past we were trying to deliver insight to our instructors, but the course was a black box and we couldn't answer basic questions like these, who needs help and what do they need help with? So what we had to do is we had to tear the cover off the black box and implementing an adaptive courseware from McGraw-Hill named Alex. Next. And the courseware gave us new insight into student behavior. These are traces of individual student work through a course. The first thing you'll notice is that they don't all start at the same place in August. And what we had is a configuration that the faculty set up with 370 topics that the students had to master. So you have a, a new insight into the class, which is they are not all the same on day one, and then you can follow individuals through the process. You'll see a student like this who starts with almost zero knowledge and proceeds to a successful completion. Another student that starts with a significant amount of knowledge and completes early. So you have to change your teaching process to match the learning needs in this modality. And then finally, you have students like this that struggle. So our ultimate goal is to deliver insight into how to help this student. Can we respond in real time to the needs of this learner? And you can do that today through the cell phone technology and other mobile technologies that are being uh, implemented. Next. So our results in this field have been really spectacular. We used to be stuck in our success rate. This is a success rate, grade of A, B, or C in college algebra at around 57, 58%. And I can go back a decade, this number didn't change. When we started to improve the design of the course and we implemented Alex in the fall of 2016, we saw dramatic increases and it's continued every 
year. So we're excited about the potential for adaptive technology and we're using it in other disciplines as well. Next. What's changing is the approach to all of the different components of the learning process. So you're moving from a fixed lesson plan to a variable one, from group presentation to individualized, from common content to personalized content. And the way to think about this is a movement from static to dynamic systems. And this is what we're seeing in every aspect of our lives, whether you're talking about healthcare or finance or music or uh, uh, to retail technology, everything is dynamic today, responsive to the needs of the individual. So that's the way we want to uh, operate in the future in education. Next. So what's actually adapting to the student? I ask this question to every vendor who comes to me and says they have the adaptive system for the future. There are two things that we found, having worked with a half dozen different systems, there are two moving parts in this machine for learning. One is lesson sequence and the other is content selection. So think of it as your syllabus in your traditional course is a lesson sequence and it's static and every student is sticking to that schedule. In an adaptive system as I showed with math, the lesson sequence can vary depending on the learner's starting point and their progression through the material. Similarly with content, you might show videos to students, you might show text for reading, you might ask them to play an interactive game. You might have other types of activities in a digital world that allow the content to be personalized. And what's actually guiding that process? There are four techniques that we've identified in these various systems. Everyone's searching for the algorithm as a solution. There are very few systems that are truly algorithmic. Alex is one of them, but Alex has had a 20-year development cycle. It started at the University of California at Irvine with a couple of faculty members and progressed through the full development of the technology. So 20 years later, we take it for granted that they have an algorithmic process, but it's taken them that long to build it. These other techniques are much easier to implement and to take advantage of and very beneficial to students as well. So when we talk about assessment in adaptation, we're talking about using formative assessment to rapidly remediate with a student. This has a huge benefit. For any student that's working at home at night with no support from an instructor, this kind of remediation can keep them moving forward in their learning process. Association is a technique where all of these different lessons are related through a lesson chart or a knowledge map or some other technique to create this ecosystem of educational outcomes. That's important because if you're going to vary the lesson sequence, you have to have some structure for varying it. And this is where the association is used. And finally, agency is a relatively new technique in the adaptive systems, but I'm excited about it because it allows us to open a new channel for conversation with a learner. The learner provides feedback that influences the recommendations from the adaptive system. And if we don't have that channel, we significantly weaken the responsiveness to the individual. So just like you think of Yelp or other techniques to gather feedback on what is uh, successful in, in different industries or different uh, domains, the same is true in education. We need that channel. We can't just wait till the end of semester evaluation to try to figure out what worked and what didn't. Next. So in order to build that, you need to think about a fundamental element. I call it the Ed Molecule. This is really a lesson. What we do is we combine objectives, assessment, and content to give a learner a process to achieve mastery. This is not new. Uh, it's been around for quite a long time. And what we've done is we've just added the capability to analyze the data at scale and to begin to use this as a building block for the educational process. So as you think about trying to either develop an adaptive system or implement one, this is the model that you should have in the back of your head for organizing the information in your course. Next. I'm grateful that you're able to attend today and I'll hand it over to Heather, our next speaker, to talk a little bit more about implementation in California. Actually, Dale, be, before we do that, let me, let me just uh, give everybody a heads up on that. So we, 
uh, heard a little bit about how to, what an adaptive system really is and how it's being implemented. Uh, and we're going to shift to another kind of application of technology, but not unrelated. And this time, really, technology is enabling the new Calbright College to assist displaced and underemployed workers to learn new skills and knowledge and helping them into more secure career paths to using lessons that can be delivered directly to learners who can use them at a time and a place that really works for them. Calbright College is going to be supporting these learners. And Heather, I'll let you tell the rest of the story. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sally. Uh, next, I believe. Um, so as Sally was just uh, mentioning, um, the state of California and the leadership specifically uh, launched by our former governor, Jerry Brown, um, realized that there were a, 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 a large portion of Californians working population that was being left behind with all of these new new economy type jobs. As we look at various industries, um, sectors of industry, none of them have, I think, um, gone drastically unchanged by all of the new types of technology that, um, that make our lives so much more wonderful today. Um, but as a result, there are a number of um, what we call stranded, even abandoned workers who are hungry to be productive, um, but don't have real-time skills and don't know how to um, apply uh, uh, some fundamental knowledge of technology and other kinds of new ways of doing work in order to um, add value in, in their areas of, of discipline. And so the, the mission of Calbright College is to work with our over 8.5 million Californians who are underemployed today. And uh, I want to acknowledge, um, and I really appreciate the um, foundational information provided by the other two presenters, but I want to acknowledge Calbright is just um, taking off now. And I uh, started in this role in mid-February, so we really are a startup in the public sector in a very established community college um, uh, setting. And so our mission is actually to serve the entire state of California and to upskill those underemployed Californians for the purpose of getting them living wage jobs with benefits that are new economy, um, that have new economy uh, challenges to them. Um, and of the um, eight and a half million underemployed Californians, we're focusing at the outset um, primarily on the 2.5 million Californians who are um, ages 25 to 34. Majority are women who are single heads of household um, and who have one or two children that they are responsible for. Um, and so we are... Uh, the four things you probably should know about Calbright College is one, we are committed to serving working poor and underemployed Californians. Second, that all of our job oriented training programs are, um, will be uh, debt free for our learners. So they will, there will be essentially free um, to our learners. Also that we are building competency based education as Sally had suggested and I can talk a little bit more about what that means to us, but tied to specific jobs. So even um, in the world in which I uh, last worked with my former company, Pathbright, and even um, while at the Gates Foundation working in higher education, um, what competency-based education means in higher education and linking those to learning outcomes is, is slightly different or dramatically different depending upon who you talk with to what we're talking about when we talk about job competencies. So what we do is we actually uh, take specific jobs working with specific employers, reverse engineer all of the competencies tied to that actual job and create an online plus a, uh, an in-person in learning experience for, those, for, the, for the training system. Um, and like I said, I'll get back into that. The, the fourth thing you should know about our system is although we have we have funding to start up this college um, that will oversee our work for the next 
seven years, we have a model for becoming and be, um, being financially self-sustainable by year four, uh, by year seven, sorry, uh, by engaging with employers who we are expecting to invest in Californians to learn their jobs. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, so the way that we work um, is that we are on the front end. So this is not the perfect um, kind of diagram of, of the order of our work, but where we start is that we actually identify those entry-level jobs that are available to people that are still new economy jobs and where we think that there is a need for a lot of skill building for people to be prepared for those jobs. We work to identify those particular jobs that employers have um, where they're not able to find enough skilled prepared people at the scale at which they need to hire. And uh, we work with them and collaborate with them in, in using their internal curricula um, to uh, then chunk it out into our specific competencies. We will um, then have available online the assessments per competency plus the instruction experience for the competencies. This is very important because a number of our uh, our learners will have um, will have some of the competencies in the form of prior learning and experience before they join our programs. So it's essential if this is self-paced competency-based education that they be able to assess out of the uh, and demonstrate mastery without having to relearn and retake courses that they've already um, mastered, uh, content that they've already mastered. And so. Um, so we'll, we will start with online competencies and assessments, and once they have mastered and completed the online competencies uh, tied to the job, they'll then uh, be in paid apprenticeships and work experiences at employer sites. This is, uh, from my former uh, experiences, essential to uh, both to the employers to be able to kind of get to know individuals and understand, even if they don't have the traditional credentials, that they do have the traditional, they do have the actual skills to be able to do the job. And similarly, for a lot of our folks who have learned online, they still need the app applied hands-on learning experience which shows that they can perform, say, a communications competency real time with their teams. And so it's a very important component to our learning experiences. And those then um, flow into full-time employment uh, with our folks. So we have a lot of technology. Um, because we are a startup at this first go-round, our first learners will, will start getting registered October 1 of this year. We will be using a variety of different um, technologies for delivering content, for tracking our coaching, uh, for doing, um, pr providing some of our tutoring capabilities. Um, and then in the future, we will be also building unique technology that uh, performs um, missing pieces that we identify. And then similarly, um, for in, in my perspective, being a technologist, as well as um, having done a lot of workforce development, that um, technology is really just a set of tools to better empower and make even more uh, rich the human interaction that happens. And I've, I feel that way about counseling, advising, as well as learning experiences and coaching and um, uh, other supports that we would provide to our learners. So there's a very much a very rich in the mentorship program that happens at the employer sites. The very rich combination between the technology and the human beings. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, uh, and I actually can forward to the following the next one. Yeah, thanks. So uh, in essence, at a super high level, we are uh, what we're building is is a um, a learning to employment platform that has uh, several different components, which I don't have time to get into, but um, it is meant to serve both working adults. Um, it is meant to serve both working adults uh, so that they are able to access the right content for the right opportunities and, and uh, real time whenever they need them. And then similarly uh, for the hiring managers, there's a way for them to um, tap into a whole new um, universe and pool of, of prepared talent 
of folks who are ready for those opportunities and to get to see their, their competencies, uh, their mastery of those and the demonstration of those um, prior to hiring those folks. You can I think of the, that should be a thank you slide. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, I will um, say that uh, just to give you a sense of well, I'll, I'll actually, I can hold, hold back on that because I think we've run out of time. But I do want to um, share with you that we're happy to, we're very much a research and development organization. So while we are building these partnerships throughout California and, um, and, and preparing folks for opportunities uh, with work, we are trying to learn about what everything that, um, uh, that works and doesn't work for particular types of people, and I don't mean just demographically speaking, but psychographically, et cetera, and to be able to report that back to the field and to be able to scale what really seems to be most effective with folks. Heather, thank you. You're welcome. That's, that's a great overview. And <laughs> uh, let me just ask if any of you have questions of one another before we go to audience questions. Heather, have you selected a technology platform for delivering the instruction? So we have, we have uh, selected a variety of different content and content delivery systems as well as coaching tracking systems that we will be testing for our one beta cohort, which is our first group, um, who will be more kind of in, in unison at least at the beginning of our programs. And then uh, starting next year, we will start to, as we test out what works and what, um, which features are meaningful for us, then we will start to actually architect uh, which kinds of existing technologies we need to continue to utilize um, in combination with which technologies are missing. Um, and so uh, that's an ongoing process, but the short answer is, for just the few uh, three program pathways that we have right now, we have selected some content delivery and other kinds of softwares in order to make those happen, make those a reality for our folks. Um, but also like beginning next year, we'll have an app for our learners that will make a, um, hopefully a much cleaner, more elegant experience for every learner who comes into our system. Great, thanks. Okay. Sure. Heather, did you have questions of either Dale or, or uh, Candace? Um, I did have a question for Candace. I really wanted to hear more about the, um, the social psychological um, uh, kind of venue and what, what kinds of mindset interventions are working for folks. We, um, just as a little bit of context, for folks who have not been historically successful in traditional education, we find that folks have a lot of stories about why they can't learn new things. And, um, and they have a lot of, um, they've been told many, in many different ways that they're failures. And so we feel that on the front end, uh, uncovering people's core assets and competencies, letting them understand them um, and appreciate and how to build on those is really critical and building up little little wins along the way helps build their confidence to succeed in our programs. But that's just what we know. <laughs> um, uh, and, um, but I, I haven't studied and I would love to know about more about what you know about those kind of interventions that empower people to become lifelong learners. Absolutely. Um, you know, I'll, I'll quote um, Albert Bandura, who said, self-belief does not ensure success, but self-disbelief assuredly spawns failure. And I think that is Amen. <laughs> for all of these, uh, these types of social psychological areas. There are a number of interventions, and I, and, I, and, you know, I talked a little bit more about the mindset, but also sort of equally important, especially I believe for, for your target population, is also senses of social belonging um, that, um, and gendering a sense of belonging in a learning group can bolster motivation and engagement and, and persistence in the face of difficulty. And there are uh, two kinds of uh, interventions uh, that you can influence belonging to enhance learning. One type focuses on changing the learner's attributions about whether they belong. And the second type uh, focuses on changing the environment and the social structure to engender social connectedness and belonging. 
And in both types of interventions, the benefits are most pronounced in areas where the people are facing challenging conditions, like solving difficult problems, high stakes tests, overcoming setbacks. Um, and there, there's a, it's probably, to go deep into that literature is probably more than we, uh, definitely more mm -hmm. than we can be delighted to set up uh, some time with you to talk about um, all the research behind social belonging, identity threat, mindset, and some interventions which we've seen uh, work in um, an online environment, both from my own work and from the work of my colleagues at Stanford. Fantastic. Um, I, I very much would look, look forward to hearing more about it as well as how to assess and uh, take the pulse of that kind of mindset along the way because Absolutely. that's something also we want to accomplish. Absolutely. One of the things I loved about what you were saying is you're both implementing things that you have some evidence that you know that work, but you also see yourselves as a big research um, environment as well. Because yeah. what's true is while we know a lot of, a lot of social science um, and learning science research has historically happened in these sort of small, um, small groups or in um, groups that may be in, in, in contexts that don't necessarily match the context of your particular learners. And so mm -hmm. one of the big powers of this technology is it enables us to both undergird what we're doing with the science, but also build the science at scale. And to make these systems work, we need to have a representation from learners in all different learning contexts with all different dimensions of diversity engaging so that the data and the models that we're building are being built from their experience, not just, you know, the, uh, the traditional psychology student uh, subjects that many research universities use to conduct their experiments. And what's so exciting these days is that we can individualize, as Dale was suggesting about the technology, we can very much individualize the offerings um, based on people's need real time, as well as um, benefit from the metadata that's all around us, as well as, um, as well as be able to kind of scale what works for various types of folks and recognize the patterns. And I yeah. think with all the technology, we just haven't had the ability to do all of that until now. Right, and then that really changes the relationship between learning research and educational practice, which is mm -hmm. really the, the big power. Um, and I just want to say one, one little thing, which is what we're all talking about is differentiating instruction. When, mostly when you're talking about personalizing learning, we're talking about differentiating instruction to meet that individual learner's need at that point in time. And making an instructional differentiation decision um, if you really want to do it well, uh, requires considering features about the learner, features about the thing that's being learned, and features about the context and how those different features interact. And if you think about it, for our little human minds, that's way too many dimensions to try and manage. And that's another big power of the technology is to help manage those multiple dimensions of features to help support the humans to make good decisions, both about how do I differentiate instruction for this learner or make good decision, or have the learner make a good decision about what's the best thing for me to do next. All right. I want to uh, turn this over to Sarah um, and ask her if we've got some questions from audience members. Thank you, Sally. We do. So the first question, and I'll invite Dale to begin the answer part of this, but the question is, what are the pros and cons of using out-of-box adaptive courseware solutions versus products like Realize IT or Realize It, which allow faculty to create adaptive experiences for their students? There are two different buckets that we use to distinguish between those strategies. One we call construct and the other configure the systems. If you're going to construct something using a product like Realize It, you're going to get a flexible result, but it would be much more costly, lengthy, and risky. So when we start that analysis working with the faculty, we make it clear that if you're going to invest in developing something that's customized at that level, you need to leave nine months to a year in your schedule to get that kind of customization. If you're going to configure something that already exists, like Alex, which 
has all of the lessons already designed. You get a constrained solution, but it's much more mature and reliable, and the data is much more valuable because you have the benefit of all of the users across multiple institutions. So you're weighing these two different models, construct and configure, against your resources. Uh, we've done both, and I like to say our ultimate goal is to make everything configurable so that we don't have individual faculty members building these very complex systems taking a lot of risk. I think that the market is moving in that direction, and part of the philosophy we have is that it's our job to accelerate the movement towards configurable systems. Thank you, Dale. And there was a second part to this question we received, and I'll invite Candice to, to answer to it first. Um, the question is, what steps should an institution take to make timely use of data from student performance in adaptive courseware such that the data can be used to make improvements in instruction around muddy points? Okay, so I wanna also just kind of build on what Dale said too, which is he gave two options, construct and configure. I think there's a third option, but that requires a shift for higher education, which is, which is to build, which is to have um, somebody construct something. This was kind of what undergirded the uh, idea in the OLI, the Open Learning Initiative, say statistics courseware that we built, is we, is we did the construction by bringing together multiple faculty multiple institutions with learning research and so on to develop the first iteration of that courseware but then creating tools so that faculty can configure that courseware as Dale was saying but but the big piece that's important is those those um, alternative versions that people were making to collect the data on those to see what's working and what's not working in terms of their adaptation uh, for different uh, learner groups and make that data and that continuous improvement process owned by the institutions of not-for-profit higher education as opposed to um, a commercial vendor. So that's what, so I, I, I'm, I'm a big advocate of both, uh, of both of configure, but also where does the construction happen that's being configured and what's the collaborative process across not-for-profit higher education to do that construction and configuration. Now, to answer your second question about, um, so, so I'll, I'll also build on what Dale said earlier, which is if you're, if you need to think about what's your, what's your outcome, what's your learning outcome, and then your, then all of the activities in, with which the student is engaging should be associated with that outcome. And then the data you collect can be put through different knowledge modeling algorithms to make estimates about the learner's current state. And you, then you give that those estimates back to an instructor so that they can see where their students are struggling, where they're getting it, and can use their expertise to best support the learner. Thank you, Candace. And Dale, did you want to add anything there? Yeah, I would say what we're trying to develop is agile academics. If we're thinking about the human component of this process, if we can help faculty members learn to trust the technology and the data, then they have to become more agile in their instruction. We think about this in terms of concrete activities that they can engage in. So for example, when an instructor is looking at a student's personalized performance in a system, they have four different tactics that they can use to help that student learn if they see a problem. One is meet with them individually in class. The second is assign a student assistant to help the student. Third is send them to tutoring. And fourth is to ask them to come to office hours. So there's some practical way for an instructor to think about how they translate this data into action. Absolutely. I mean, and the other way is right, as actually right in the classroom. I, uh, the statistics courseware that we built at Carnegie Mellon, I actually used and adapted when I was teaching uh, my data analysis class at Stanford. And I would tell the students, work through this module. Um, if I taught on Tuesdays and Thursdays, work through this module um, before uh, 6 a.m. on Thursday morning. And then I'd look at the data from the system and I get a very clear insight into of those major outcomes and concepts that I wanted the students to 
get through working through the material, where they're struggling, where they're getting it. And I would start every class showing them, this is what I learned about from your interactions with the system about what you're getting and what you're not getting. And so this is how we're spending our time in class. So yeah. the students are very clearly that, um, that their, their, their actions in, and the insight I got would very much um, um, allow them to, uh, was having a big influence in the way the class was structured. So Candace, you are a model agile academic. <laughs> Great, yeah. thank you both. You're I'm gonna there. share a question with Heather. Um, Heather, if students demonstrate mastery of key competencies in college or university courses at one point in time, have you gathered from employers that they there there will be a future in which employers were, will ask employees to re-demonstrate their mastery of certain competencies such as critical thinking or communication? Um, so I think what we're seeing is a much more fluid, continuous uh, demonstration of mastery real time. So what's happening out in the world is new jobs are being created every day. I'm afraid I'm very guilty of that this very second over here at Calbright, creating new jobs that people don't recognize the titles of and the responsibilities are different and don't comport to any particular private sector, public sector, nonprofit sector job that people have heard of in the past. And therefore the competencies for the jobs are going to be different and unique. And I think this is happening real time with every new, with every company that's creating new software, new work, and new jobs. And so what we're finding is that people, even in large companies, have more of a, um, a gig-based, just-in-time kind of mindset. Oh, I need to learn these skills in order to do this job, which is needed by the, by the employer. And so we are building and trying to iterate on a development cycle whereby we can um, use as much of efficient technology to um, real time kind of build the right competencies and associate them with a particular job because we know that that's something that is um, is really um, is made obscure and um, and it seems to be a very kind of time intensive labor intensive process these days so what we're finding is a lot of times if you look at even um, databases that have a listing of jobs and titles that they're kind of outdated by the time that they're reported um, out in the public. So we're trying to get something that is much more real time to the nature of these new jobs being created and the competencies and the instruction with those and the assessments of those are real time as well. So I think employers are going to be looking for people who can um, uh, identify the competencies through their systems or however very quickly that they need to master to do a job and then have access to the right content and the right experiences to master those those competencies okay thank you Heather and we have another question I'll leave it open so if you feel very strongly pleased to go ahead um, the question is what are the biggest institutional barriers to overcome individualized learning as you define it I can start with a couple that are different. They're maybe um, specific to uh, workforce development and jobs separately from um, higher education. But um, I will say that there are a lot of, um, I would say a lot of sectors and structures that are not built for this kind of real time sharing of information achieving new competencies. And so when I look at the policies and the processes, for example, uh, I could give you one example coming from uh, a community college system where my board of trustees must approve a, a curriculum before I can start using it and putting it in a catalog and, um, and, and offering it to folks. That, that is, that's kind of counter um, this real-time process of, of standing up new competency instruction um, per an employer's need per real time. Um, and so there are just a million policies and, um, and uh, uh, demands, at least from the public sector, that um, are 
a lot of them have been fashioned for very wonderful reasons, but really haven't been kept up in um, kept in touch with the pace of what we need to do these days and the ways in which we need to do a lot of what we're attempting to do. I All right, I'm. Oh, go ahead, Dale. One other structural impediment we have to innovation is this idea of seat time and having some. Carnegie credit hour classification, the movement is to mastery. And making the culture shift away from time on task and start focusing on outcomes from that task is a huge shift. It takes a long time to convince people to focus on mastery as a model. Yeah, I agree. I also think that sort of prior or currently, prior, prior to this technology revolution, um, I think faculty created learning experience, created learning experiences by tradition, you know, replicating the best of what they've seen or what they experienced. And this idea that now it's possible to observe and learn from the practices of teaching and learning at scale, which, in which turns the learning design process into a scientific process, which you think faculty would gravitate towards because most faculty are trained as researchers, but there seems to be kind of a, a barrier between my teaching practice and my research practice. And I think helping people really go through that change of being able to sort of see teaching as something which you can engage in a scientific process um, is just a real shift in how people view their, their identity and their work. It's interesting because in 2007, the U.S. Institute of Medicine called for the creation of a learning healthcare system, quote, in which knowledge generation is so embedded into the core of practice of medicine that it is a natural outgrowth and product of the healthcare delivery process and leads to continuous improvement in healthcare. And I think that's we need to have that same idea around higher education to take advantage of the transformative process of technology and in research and improving education and meeting the demands, um, we have to create an analogous learning system which, which knowledge generation is embedded in the core of our teaching practice. I think um, you guys have done a remarkable job of slipping around in the whole space that has to do with what is really enabled by technology. And Candace, your, your notion of learning from the learner, if you will, to improve practice, uh, and, and Dale, that's obviously part of what you're talking about as well. While uh, people have been trying to do that for years, it really is technology that is enabling us to do this at a scale that is useful to then apply. And uh, I think too, Heather, the kinds of things that you've brought up with the goals and the uh, ways in which Calbright College is going to be addressing uh, displaced workers or underemployed workers can only be enabled by utilizing in the best ways technologies that are available to us. I'd like to ask each of you to just take a minute or two and sum up anything you'd like to with regard to these ideas. I'll start. I want to say we have to think holistically about the transformation that's underway. It's not a technological challenge. It's a pedagogical, technological, cultural, sociological challenge and we can't get fixated on technology so when we think about classroom and a cell phone we have to think about the person holding the cell phone and all of the factors that go into that learning process a great way to put that heather you may be on mute exactly exactly i i was sorry um i i uh, I think um, I think Dale said it very well. I think that um, that the um, I think that our commitment to being intellectually honest and really learning about what genuinely doesn't work 
and what genuinely does work, but precisely for whom and why is, um, is I think, one of the biggest challenges that I've, I face in, in taking, taking this mission on. And I think that um, it really does take a movement that includes educators, um, but also all member, all manner of different types of people in our society to be willing to be open and honest about what's not working, where the blockages are, and how we can get past those. That very well put. Candace? Yeah, I agree with, uh, with everything both Dale and Heather have said. <laughs> I would just go back to my, the quote that I used at the end of my talk from Bill Balmall around, you know, uh, the, the revol we cannot go beyond our current levels of productivity without a complete revolution in our approach to uh, teaching. And I would, uh, you know, my, my question is still there who's going to lead this. And I guess my, what I would implore is that we not outsource the leadership of this revolution to the commercial sector, that we have the power within not-for-profit higher education to, uh, we have the researchers, we have the mission, we have the students, we have the ability to work together and collect the data um, and uh, lead this revolution. And I think that's where, that's from where it should be led. Candice, I'm on board. Um, I want to thank our audience members for participating in this 50th anniversary uh, series. And by the way, our next webinar is going to be in November, and it's going to be co-hosted by Rachel Christensen and uh, Gina Johnson as we look into the types of data that's used for policy and planning activities. Uh, please check out the uh, website, NCHEM's website, to register for that, but also to download uh, and be able to watch this webinar uh, if you didn't get to see all of it. <clears throat> uh, I want to also thank very much my colleagues, Candace Till, Dale Johnson, and Heather Hiles, for sharing their expertise and their experiences. I think you all have to agree that they are remarkable human beings. And as Candace said, leading the pack through their uh, public sector mission and desires. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Sally. You're welcome. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, everybody.